morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Bonnie. The first reading on this second Sunday after the Epiphany is from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. A reading from Isaiah. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward is with God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. And I'm sorry. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves. Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to get you please turn to our opponent song of the day, Psalm 40, which sings responsibly by all verses. I waited patiently upon the Lord, who stood to me, and I heard my cry. The Lord lifted me out of the midst of the pit, out of the fiery clay, and set my feet upon the high ground, making me my own of the ocean shore. The Lord put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many shall see and stand in awe, and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are they who trust in the Lord. They do not turn to the things for those who have Great are the wonders you have done, O Lord my God. In your plans for us, none can be compared with you. Oh, that I could make them known and tell them, but they are more than I can count. Happy are they who trust in the Lord. They do not turn to enemies or to those who follow lies. Great are the wonders you have done, O oh Lord my God. In your plans for us, none can be compared with you. Oh, that I can make them known and tell them what they more than I can count.
out of a desolate pit and set my feet upon a high cliff. Psalm 40 is a difficult psalm to chant, but it's a good one. The second reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians, book 1, chapters 1 through 9. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Paul called to be an disciple of Jesus Christ by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sacrificed in Jesus Christ, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I will give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Jesus Christ. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech, in knowledge of every kind. Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you're not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless, blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and by him you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would the congregation please rise and join us in the appointed gospel verse. <laughs>
Please be seated and let us pray. Lord Jesus, today on the second Sunday after Epiphany, open our hearts and minds to prepare to wrestle with this topic. What do you seek? What are we seeking? What is life all about? Help us to look to you, our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You hear this psalm? Psalm 40? It's hard to play this thing because it's long. Psalm 40 says this, The Lord lifted me out of the desolate pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a high cliff, making my footing sure. What did this Jesus do? He reached into the tomb, and he grabbed onto that dead man Lazarus, and he pulled him out of the tomb. He lifts us up. He lifts us up. We don't lift ourselves up. He lifts us up. Now, today's sermon is going to be hard work, so I want you to pay special attention today. So the burden is on you. Who died this past week? Lisa Marie Presley. And if you hear the people on the news, oh, they put her up on a pedestal, they talk about her, oh, you know, Elvis's daughter and so on. You know, our society is sick and twisted. We're like the people who stand at the, on the ground and look up to somebody who's on the, on the ledge and they're going to jump and we yell, jump. Think of the people that we have lost due to drugs and alcohol. Yes, alcohol is a drug. Drugs. Let me see. Elvis himself, 1977. Michael Jackson, who was married to Lisa Marie Presley. Her son committed suicide two years ago because he had drug issues. Heath Ledger, Whitney Houston, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Chris Farley, John Bellucci, Amy Winehouse, Prince. And at the CIA, Anthony Bodine struggled with drug and alcohol issues. And what do we do to these people? At the CIA, we have like a wall. It's like a memorial that talks about his cooking ability and it. He's, he was the best show, it's the best show on CNN. I watched him all the time. I loved his adventures going around. But yet, we need to learn, look at the lives of these people and maybe learn something from that. All the money in the world, all the fame, all the glitz, all the glamour, it's all nothing. This Lisa Marie Presley, it's so sad that I can't even you know, talk about it, right? She found her father dead when she was eight years old. He died of a drug overdose in the bathroom. She was worth $100 million. That was her net worth. Her business manager stole her money. You know what her net worth was when she died? Uh, that's a minus sign. $16 million. She was a recluse for the last couple of years. Her last public appearance, she looked like a train wreck. It was a horrible, horrible thing. She first went into rehab when she was 17 years old and struggled with it her entire life. She was married four times. You know why she, why she got divorced from Michael Jackson? Because he chose drugs over her. Uh, think about that for a minute. It's a tragedy. What is wrong with our country anyway? I'll tell you what's wrong with our country. We've said, <clears throat> We don't want no stinking religion. We don't want God telling us what to do. We're going to do whatever we want. You know, there's another story that's kind of interesting. It has to do with uh, this guy here, Buddha. Let's talk about Buddha a little bit here. Now, this is a Happy Lands Buddha. When you go to a good Chinese restaurant, they usually they have a Happy Lands Buddha in gold. My goal is to look like a Happy Lands Buddha. <laughs> I eat at the Chinese restaurant. Now I make it two dozen dumplings. And yeah, they, they three egg rolls. And yeah, that's me. I, that's my goal. And notice, he's happy. He's happy. He's smiling. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Buddha. First of all, what date did we use for Jesus? 7 BC to 30. I'm sorry, 7. 7 B.C. to 33 A.D. What date do we use for Muhammad? 570 to 632 A.D. So we have a pretty good, you know, with Buddha, we don't quite know when he was born. 400, 500 B.C., we don't have an exact date. The first good biography of Buddha was written maybe three or 400 years after his, after his earthly existence. So it's not terribly accurate. So there's a lot of legends involved in Buddha. But here's what we know about him. Buddha, right, was the son of a prince. You mean Elvis is like a king? Yeah, he was a, his father was a king. 
And a, an astrologer came up to the king and said, I'll do a star chart on the boy, Siddhartha Gautama, that was his name. And what is it? Your son is either going to be a king or a religious leader. Naturally, the king is a wise man. He's horrified at the prospect of his son becoming a religious leader. I don't blame him for that one. So he said, he's going to be a king. So what am I going to do? I'm going to shelter him from all the pain of the world. Mm -hmm. So they kept the kid cloistered, walled up, like COVID quarantine. Wow. No contact with the outside world whatsoever. When the kid was 29, right, he finally said he, he was able to get his charioteer to take him outside of the walls of the palace. He's been cloistered, living hidden from reality his entire life. And when he goes out, what does he see? He sees poverty. Do we have poverty in the United States? Ah, you have no idea what poverty is. Last night we watched a report on the news. There's something, what, 20 million children running loose in Brazil that have no parents at all. They live on the streets. When you go to India, people live like down by the river with like poles and those blue tarps over it and the children run around naked because they don't have any clothes. They eat out of garbage dumps. That's the kind of poverty that he saw. What else did he say? He saw an old man. Yeah. Well, is that a shocking thing? We live in Rhinebeck. We have a lot of old people around here. No problem at all. Well, for him, it's a, it's a shocking thing because he didn't know that people got old. Then he sees a sick person. He's been sheltered. He didn't know about sickness. Then he sees a dead person. And what did he do? He went home. He left his wife. He left his son. And he went off into the sunset and he sat under the Bodhi tree to try to think about what the meaning of life is. The Buddha means the enlightened one. Enlightenment? So he sits there and his, here's, 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 his, here's his enlightened idea. That this is the world of suffering. Right? And that suffering can be avoided. How? By escaping from it. How do you escape from it? Well, you do the eightfold path. Basically, you save yourself. Upward mobility. Remember, Jesus reaches in and the Lord lifts you up. Here, with Buddhism, you lift yourself up. And what's the point? The world is such, so suffering, such a painful, horrible place, you want to escape from the world, right? And the goal is to avoid reincarnation. Remember, birth, life, death, reincarnation, birth, life, the endless cycle over and over again. The world is full of suffering and pain, and you want to escape from it. It's painful for Lisa Marie Presley to live. So what does she do? She turns to drugs and alcohol to escape, the, numb the pain, right? The Greek word for drugs is what? Pharmakia. Well, pharmakia, pharmacy, pharmakia. It means sorcery, escape from reality. We're Christians. Do we believe that this is a world of suffering and pain? Yeah, there's suffering and pain in the world. But it's not caused by the world itself being evil. God created the heaven and the earth and it is good. Corruption entered the world with the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. We expect the world to have sin and death. We expect death is a part of reality. I did a funeral, you know, a, a message on a death and dying, what, a year or so ago or something? It's, it's on YouTube. You don't pass away, you die. Death is the enemy that who defeated? Jesus defeats sin and death. We don't say death doesn't exist, it's only an illusion. Is there pain? Yeah, people have pain. People have disease. People have death. But is that the way God wanted it to be? The answer is no. The world is broken and fallen because sin and death entered the world. Satan is running amok. The world, the flesh, the devil. And what is our solution to it? Our national solution to it is, oh no, don't depend on Jesus, don't depend on Christ, the incarnation, stop. What is Epiphany about? For the next several weeks, we're gonna talk about the baptism of Christ, the servant to the Gentiles, and the incarnation. Okay, ready? What, is car what does chili con carne mean? Meat. In carne is meat. In the meat, incarnation means in the flesh. What is reincarnation? Recycled meat. Recarne again. Recarne again. Recarne again. We don't believe in reincarnation. We believe it is appointed for man once to die and after comes the judgment. Jesus, God, did something about the human condition. 
He doesn't say escape from reality, meditation, levitation, pharmacia, drugs, alcohol, numb the pain, mindless entertainment, video games for 20 hours a day, escape from reality. No, the answer is we live in this world and what do you do? You don't want to have a world where you escape from the world. You want to live in a place where you are a player, where you can make a change in the world. That's the problem with people. They sit on the sidelines and they're passive and they're drunk and stupid and the world passes them by. You want to be an active player in life. We might not always win the world, the flesh, and the devil. Usually they do win, but you know what? We gave them a hell of a fight. We fight these people. We stand up and we fight and we stand for what is right in the world and it drives them crazy, right? So let's talk about our gospel lesson today a little bit. Right? First of all, here's a book. Right? This is Dr. Clarence Carson. He used to teach at Grove City College. He wrote this book in 1969. I actually talked to him on the phone a couple times. I'm always talking to these people on the phone, right? What a southern gentleman. What's the name of this book? The Flight from Reality. What? Is that our problem? That's a problem with our world. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't say, escape from the world. Go shave your head and live in a monastery and have no contact. That, that's, that's the Buddha's solution to your problem. Escape from a world of suffering. We don't do that. We live in this world and, we, and our job is to make the world a better place as Christians. So today's gospel lesson deals with the incarnation. What does it mean? Well, it starts with John the Baptist. Three hour lecture of John the Baptist. Watch the videos from last, uh, from last December during Advent where you obsess about John the Baptist. Who is he? He's the one, the forerunner of Christ, okay? So he is doing his job. He's baptizing people in the Jordan River. Suddenly, he sees Jesus coming toward him. Stop. You see that? Jesus coming toward him. How did he know? There's a thousand of people coming toward him. How does he know that little silhouette up there is Jesus? Because he's a prophet. His job is to identify the Messiah and announce it to people like us. So he sees Jesus coming toward him. And what does he say? Hey, you got any crystal meth? I have to escape from reality. This world is a world of suffering. No, he doesn't. He says, behold, what? The Lamb of God who takes away what? The sin of the world. The problem with the world, it's sin and death enter the world with the fall. You see? Jesus came to do what? To do this. On the cover of your bulletin today, Bobby was talking about what a beautiful picture of that little that lamb and so on. Yeah, that lamb's feet are tied because it's about to be sacrificed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. We don't do animal sacrifices anymore like they did in the temple. Instead, Jesus is our one-time lamb who, whose blood set us free. You got that? So he's the lamb of God. We have our red pyramids, right? And on the red pyramids on the altar, we have G, the, 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 the couched lamb. So that picture on your bulletin is on our pyramids. So the lamb of God, right? He's the one, right? He's the one. And who is he? He's a man who is ahead of me and he lived before me. John says, I must decrease, he must increase. What do we, why is John the greatest man who ever lived according to Jesus? Because he knew his place and he knew his job, right? Is he trying to grab Jesus' job? Is he trying to say, I'm the Messiah, give me the money, right? No, no, he knows his place, he knows and he does his duty. You know, there's a lot to be said for people who just do their job, you know? You're a politician, you're a congressman, just do your job. Stop running for president in 12 years from now, right? Just do your job and do it well, and then people will come to you and say, we want you for a higher leadership position. John knew who he was. He knew, who are we? We are children of God. We are baptized Christians, that's who you are. Your job is to be a Christian, to be salt and light in the world, to make this world a better place, not to escape from the world, okay? Again, that theme comes over and over again. And, he says, and then he says, I came baptizing with water for this reason, why? To prepare people for the coming of the Messiah. Quick, then we have another scene. 
he gives his testimony about what? The baptism of Jesus. Because Epiphany is about baptism time. Baptism of Jesus, right? And he describes the baptism event. When the dove descended on him, that is the sign that John was waiting for. He baptized thousands of people. The dove didn't come down and descend with the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. John says, I myself have seen and testified. Stop. Mrs. Isaacs and I, we're, we're like the world's most boring people. What do we do? We watch main cabin masters on TV. And then we're tired of that, we watch those true crime shows, you know, and forensic files. I myself am an expert in forensic medicine now, forensics. I'm an expert in this because I watch the show all the time, right? What, and who, who are the people that they interview? Expert witnesses, Dr. Bodden, right? Expert witnesses. And what do they do? They'll say something like, this type of blowfly with these wings can only be found in the three mile radius of Stottsburg. It could not have happened up in Albany, right? Expert witnesses. Do we care what my opinion of these insects are? No, we don't. They don't call me to testify. However, they call expert witnesses in. An expert witness is someone, they must not have much of a life. They devote like 40 or 50 years of their life to studying certain kinds of maggots or something. It's a very strange thing, right? Expert witnesses. When an expert witness says something, what do you say? Nothing. Their opinion counts <laughs> because it's an informed opinion, right? Well, John the Baptist is an expert witness who is testifying, who's telling you this is the Son of God. You got that? Okay? My opinion doesn't really count. His opinion does because he's uh, the last of the Old Testament prophet. He's an expert witness, an expert opinion. So when John speaks, you listen. Well, the next day, he's standing there, and there's two of his disciples that are with him. Now, we know from late, right, late on, who are these? Andrew, right? Who's the other disciple, the other student? Well, it's John the evangelist who wrote the Gospel of John. When you read John, he's funny. He never says his name. He's always in the background. That's the way it should be, too. He lifts up Jesus, and he himself stands back. It's not all about John. What, what is that? The, the, the hot new biography out now. Uh, what is it? The, the one that Prince Harry wrote? Uh, Spare, right? Now, in my case, I would call the book Spare Me. Spare Me. Yeah. <laughs> Guy's like a spoiled rich, spoiled rich kid, right? And I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to feel sorry for him, you know? You know? Oh, I've suffered so much. It's so hard being a royal person. They give you millions of dollars and you cut a ribbon once a year and you have to wear like a uniform or something. Can't do it. Can't. Too much responsibility, right? Um, again, you know, we put these people on a pedestal, right? And they have miserable lives. It's a horrible thing. So John the Baptist then, this, the, the two disciples. So John puts, John the evangelist stands back. Not the same as John the Baptist. And, and he's, he's, and his, he, John the Baptist and the disciples are watching, right? And here's Jesus. And what does John say? Again, he says, behold, the Lamb of God, okay? Stop. Is that sort of interesting? I talked about this last week. I'll talk about it again because we learn by repetition. Here's Jerusalem. Where's Bethlehem? Six miles away, right down there. What do they do in Bethlehem? The city of David where Jesus is born? The city of David where the hills of Judea are over here? That's where they raise the lambs. For what? Every year. The day of preparation for Passover, according to Flavius Josephus, they slaughter 30,000 lambs in the temple. You look at your bulletin cover, there's 29,000 other ones like that. 30,000 lambs are slaughtered in the temple in Jerusalem. The blood would have been running in the temple. It's not all clean, nice, shiny marble. It's a place where innocent, beautiful lambs are slaughtered. And people say, why is that? Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. We have to pay a price to cover our sins. Jesus is the lamb. We don't do it anymore. We don't, he, he is the one time, it's finished, right? The one time sacrifice on the cross. So then what happens? He says, the lamb of God. Well, the two disciples heard this and they followed Jesus. You got this? Is that sort of a big deal? You know, it's pretty hard to get students to go to college these days. 
Are you, Roxanne, are you going to say to the CIA, you should really transfer to Marist, it's a better school. No, we want to keep our students there. John the Baptist wants to keep his students, his disciples. He doesn't want to give away his students. But John, because it's not about John, it's about Jesus, he sets his disciples loose from their, ob what obligation? Remember the ancient world? Do we pay tuition? No. You go to a, a master, rabbi, and you say, I want to be your student. And what do you do in exchange? You build the fire, you cook the breakfast, you, pop up, you, you puff up the little pillow, you know, you, you sing them uh, to, to bed at night. You know, I need students like this, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, the, you know, that's how they pay the tuition. You follow them around for four or five years, and when you're done, you graduate, okay? Well, John gives away two of his prime disciples, right? And, and so they start following Jesus, right? And then Jesus, you know, looks at the heck, and there's these two guys following him. It's very, very interesting, right? And he says, well, what are you looking for, right? What would we say? Uh, I want revenge. Yeah, or I'd like to hit the $1.34 billion lottery like the guy up in Maine. Or I want political power so I can really make a difference in the world. Is that what we want? Yeah, that's the kind of stuff we want. Do we say, I want eternal life and salvation? I'm seeking the bread of life. I want to follow the Lamb of God. You see, we're asking for the wrong things. You think money is going to make you happy? Lisa Marie Presley, $100 million. And the poor thing had a miserable, horrible, horrible life. Think about that. She was in so much pain, she's self-medicating. Drugs, alcohol, alcohol, drugs, more drugs, more drugs, and finally she died at age 54. All the money in the world, all the power in the world is not going to help you. The love of Christ, that's what helps you. And not only is Christ good for the hereafter, we love eternal life stuff, but he'll keep you clean and sober and focused here and now. It's a beautiful world. It's not a world you have to escape from. Even with the wind blowing, it's a beautiful day out there. Get out there and breathe that fresh air. Listen to the, Linda says, oh look, the birds are out in force today. All of a sudden we have like a million birds out in our yard. Maybe spring's coming at some point and the birds are back in town again. Things like that you celebrate. Things like the grandchildren, <coughs> right? What good does it do if you're dead? You can't be with your grandchildren. What, are, what is being with the grandchildren worth anyway? Let me see, um, $4.48 or something. <laughs> no, there's no money in the world is better than being with your grandchildren. And if you're dead, you can't enjoy being with them. Except for you two. <laughs> it's going to cost Steve a fortune, you coming in. Yeah, Beekman Arms again. <laughs> Steve, I'll lend you the money because it, it, no, so all the money in the world doesn't help, right? So, so, the, so, so, what are you looking for? Well, and they say rabbi, which means teacher. What does that mean? It doesn't do any good to be a teacher or be a professor, to be the world's best preacher, or whatever. If you don't have students and people who listen to you, right? What's wrong? What's wrong with a lot of people who go to college? Go to well, they probably shouldn't be in college to begin with. They should be working somewhere, right? But. When they go, they don't really want to listen. They don't listen carefully to the lectures. They don't read the books. Well, these are students who they call Jesus teacher because they want to listen. When you come to church, you should say, I'm going to pray that I will be clear and focused today so I can listen to the gospel reading, the first and second lesson, the liturgy, sing the hymns, and listen to the sermon. You want to be an eager student of the word. Then they say, they say, well, where are you staying? And Jesus said, what? Come and see. Stopped. Wouldn't it have been a good point for Jesus to say, okay, Sermon on the Mount. Write this down. No, instead, he says, come and see. You see that? Do you have to be like a great, you know, systematic theologian to explain the 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 highlights of the Athanasian Creed like Bobby Chappé does. She obsesses about the Athanasian Creed. That's nice. Here's what you do. Just come and see. Come and see what? Jesus in action. 
Jesus, whose words and deeds are perfectly balanced. Jesus, who walks on the water. Jesus, who feeds the 5,000. Jesus, who called Lazarus out of the tomb. Lazarus, come out. Jesus lifted Lazarus out of the tomb. That's what G Andrew and John saw because they followed Jesus. They came and they saw where he was staying. And they remained there all day. You know what? You don't, you don't, get, you don't follow Christ by coming to church once or walking the aisle at a Billy Graham rally and then you're done with it. It's an ongoing, lifelong relationship. You come to church every week. You take Holy Communion. You read the Bible. You do a little bit of heavy lifting on your end. You have to be an active participant in it. It's very important. And it's a beautiful thing. And they remained to him around 4 o'clock. Now, one of the two, we're going down the home stretch here, so don't tune out on me. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, St. Andrew. You know, the patron saint of Scotland, it's the X cross. You know, remember with, with saints, you always have the implement of their death. So the X is, he was crucified on an X-shaped cross. Who is he? He's Simon Peter's brother. And what does he do? The first thing Andrew does is to go and to find his brother, Simon. And he says to him, what? We have found the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. You know, you could back up here, a little footnote. You could go through the list of all the titles in today's sermon, and that would have been a good sermon. The Lamb of God, the one, the one who takes away the sins of the world, the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah. They're all, it's all here in today's readings. We found the Messiah. Well, so what did Andrew do? He brought his brother Simon to Jesus. And Jesus looked at Simon, and he said to him, You're Simon Bar-Jonas, si Simon, son of John. Okay, break it down. He receives a new name, Cephas, which means Peter. Cephas is Aramaic, so Peter. So his name is Peter, son of John. So what does that mean? Peter means rock. So his name is Rocky Johnson. Rocky Johnson, that's his name. He gets a new name. Because in Christ, you receive a new name. He doesn't know the old dead you. He knows the new you. So very often, Saul becomes Paul, right? Abram becomes Abraham. So you get a new name. Jacob becomes Israel. So he gets a new name. Now let me talk for one second here about this. Who is uh, St. Peter anyway? Suppose Andrew said, eh, I'm not going to tell him anything. St. Andrew does what all Christians are supposed to do. That's why I love this guy. He's always bringing people to church, bringing people to Christ, introducing people to Christ. That, we need more of that. We need more St. Andrews. Just come and see. Come and, hey, come and see. Hey, hey, you know. That's what we need more of. Beautiful guy, St. Andrew. Doesn't have any attention on himself. He just introduces people, right? Now, who's St. Peter? That's his brother. Do we love Peter? Yeah. About a third of the book of Acts is the adventures of St. Peter. He's the guy who, you know, denies Christ three times. He's the guy who stands up in front of the people that... that um, yelled out, crucify Jesus, and said to him, you crucified the Son of God. You people did. He was the Messiah. All of a sudden, he got a spine because he met the risen Lord. Peter, and there are three people you need to know about the New Testament. Jesus, of course, Peter and Paul. Three people. Those three people changed the world. These three people are why we are Christians today, 2,000 years later. And it all started because Andrew said to his brother, hey, Simon, come on, I want, you, I want to introduce you to somebody. He's the Messiah, we found him. Now, let's stop and wrap this whole thing up. Our problem in our society is that we don't want to believe in Jesus. We reject God, we reject Christ, we reject his plan for us. The world has suffering, the world has death, and entered the world with the fall. God sent his son, incarnation, incarnation, in the meat, in the flesh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God loved us so much, he sent his own son down here to help us. Your help is not found at the end of a needle. Your help is not found in a bottle. Your help is not found in all, any of the strange things, meditation and levitation. Your help will not come from Buddha. 
Your problem, you can't lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. We receive God's grace as a free gift. He reaches into the tomb and grabs us and pulls us up out of the pit. And what does he do according to the psalm? He sets us up on a high mountain, up where God is. He lifts us out of the gutter and restores us to sanity and to health here on earth so that we can be an active participant and a player and make this world a better place. No escaping from reality. None of this stuff. Escape from reality? No, that's not a good thing. You want to be an active player and be a participant. That's what Christians are called to do, to make the world a better place. We fight the world, we fight the flesh, and we fight the devil. And we do it because we believe that Christ died for us and he's our savior. The epiphany is about the incarnation. Now, this, that's what it is. It's not about reincarnation. It's about the incarnation of Christ. The way, the truth, and the life. That is true enlightenment. You don't have to sit under a Bodhi tree to become a Buddha, the enlightened one. We have the enlightenment. It's the way, the truth, and the life, and it's in Jesus. Amen. Amen.